بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I'm going to go over the sujood al saho quicker because I realized that I went into too much detail, it got too complicated, so I'm going to make it really simple uh, so that people don't, uh, they don't get overwhelmed by the, uh, trying to work out what's going on in their prayer. The, um, the saho in, in, in Maliki is, is uh, the key thing to remember is that you have qabli and ba'di. So you have a, you know, a qabli is something that you do before you actually exit from the prayer, and a ba'di is something that you do after. So qabli means before in Arabic, ba'di means after. And the basic principle of saho is it has to be, you, you, you intentionally forgot uh, to do something, and uh, the, uh, if it's one of the eight sunan and mu'akkada, which are stress sunan, because you have light sunan and stress sunan. The sunan and mu'akkada, there's a mnemonic device that the Mauritanians use, which is useful. So I'll give you that. Sinani, Sinani, Shinani, Kadajimani, Ta'ani, Adad al sunan al thamani yeah. Uh, that's the mnemonic. You can do it also. I'll do it for the English uh, people. If somebody wants to be clever and work out a, a English version of that, they can do that. Bring it tomorrow. Sinani, shinani, kada jimani, taani, adad sunan al thamani. So two, four, six, eight. So each one of those represents one of the. Uh, so the sinani is the surah, and the uh, the sir that you do. You have to recite a surah after Fatiha. That's sunnah mu'akkada in the first two rakats, and then sir that you recite it silent when it's silent. And then shinani is the tashahud al-awwal, and the tashahud al-thani. Right, each one of those is a sunnah mu'akkada. Kada and like that also. Jimani, right? Which is the jahar, the saying the surah out loud. Jahar means out loud. And julus, sitting. The, the first sitting is uh, sunnah mu'akkada. The second sitting, you have to sit at least for the salam, but sitting for the tashahud is, is, is sunnah also. And then ta'ani, which is, what's the ta'ani? <laughs> the tahmida and the tasmi'ah. So saying uh, Allahu Akbar and saying Sami'a Allahu Liman Hamida, the whole thing though. So the only time you would do sajda to sahu is you miss two of them or more. So if you miss any of these, and with the exception of the last one, it's two or more. All right, because there's sunnah mu'akkada as a, as a doing the takbir throughout and doing the tasmi'ah throughout is sunnah mu'akkada. So if you miss two sunan, the light sunan, or one of the heavy sunan, then you have to do the saho. If you... If you omit, if you fail to do it, it's qabli. If you do something excessive, it's badi. That's the rule. So it's not, it's, not, it's not hard. And that's the most basic thing that you need to know. The other ones, you know, the... Uh, mm -hmm. What was the ta'ani again? Ta'ani is the tahmida and the tasmi'ah, saying Allahu Akbar as you move into your positions, and then saying the sami'a Allahu liman hamida. Uh huh. Well, as you move, when you start, with the exception of the julus, the first julus, you say it when, once you rise to the full standing position. All the other ones, you say it at the outset of your movement. What do you mean? Yeah, Rabbana wa hamd. And then you go down, yeah. 
And then you say Allahu Akbar. Go down. Takbira and the and the tahmida. Takbira and tahmida. Those are the ta'ani. Takbira saying Allahu Akbar and the and the tahmida or the tasmi'a saying Sami Allahu liman hamida is Sunnah Mu'akada. So any of those eight with the exception of the ta'ani, it takes two or more if you miss those. And then the light sunan, if you miss three of the sunan, either mu'akkada or light, then it's uh, wajib to do the sahu. If you miss one of the, or two of the sunan mu'akkada, it's mandu. Once you go, go to three, then it becomes wajib. The prayer is invalid if you didn't do it. In other words, if you do, if you miss one of these, or 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 two light sunan, then it's mandu to uh, to do the sunnah the the sujud the sahu. If you forget to do it, if it's a badi, you do it even if it's after a year. And they say targhim in the shaitan because shaitan likes to create waswasa and forgetfulness. So it's just that Allah, you know, that this is to. It's really targhim in the shaitan. You know, it's just to let shaitan know that. You know, Allah has given me ways to redress the games that you play with me. Um, so that, if 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 it's a, if it's a qabli, then you do it if it's if you're, you know, if not very much time has elapsed and you're still in the masjid, you do the qabli. You haven't gone far from the place, all right? Then you do you do it as a yeah as a badi exactly. So. Uh, as long as it's near, you know, that's what it says. So if you forget to do it, then you do it again. Yeah, exactly. It's still valid. Uh, now, if it goes to three sunan and mu'akkada, or three light sunan, either one, doesn't matter. If it's three sunan or more, then it's wajib to do this. So if you don't do it, you have to make up the prayer again. All right, because the prayer is invalid. Mm -hmm. So just as an example, so if you don't follow the iqama before you pray, you automatically have one. No, the iqama is not, the iqama is mandub, and it's not, if you miss the iqama, it doesn't affect your prayer. Okay, so when you're saying light sunnah, you're just meaning the prayer. Inside the prayer. Well, in, inside, the inside the prayer. prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you missed one takbir, it does. You don't do any saho. Right. If you do a saho, then you, the prayers. You know, you can invalidate your prayer if you do uh, something that you don't need to do purposely. So it's important to know that. Uh huh. Oh, is the out loud and silent? If mm -hmm. you do part of the raka, like you know, out loud, and you realize, oh, you catch yourself, and you go back. Right, you go back. Then, then that's fine. That doesn't count. That doesn't, unless you did. You had to repeat the fatiha. Then it's a badi that you owe because you 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 did more than. Well, no, it's the women would go by. Yeah, they, they would go because women do the jahar on their own. You know, if you're if you're on your own, they're only loud enough to hear yourself, but it's still jahar. That's the the maximum of sir, and it's the minimum of jahar. So that they share that. So he says, uh, this is Sheikh Bashir, one of my teachers, that. Uh, there's, there's three basic uh, things to know. The first is forgetfulness for a fard from the obligations of prayer, like forgetting a raka' or a sajda, because those are fard. So you also rectify those with sujood as sahu. all right? You know, if you forget a fard in a prayer, you have to do sahu. But it's, 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 it, because it's a fard, you know, it's wajib to do that, to redress it, all right? 
but it's only after you have completed, you know, you've rectified whatever you missed. So if you missed a rakat, uh, and, and, and you realize it, that you missed your second rakat, you did the julus, and you missed your second rakat, then you have to do, you make up that rakat, exactly. So, uh, and if you're unable to do that, you know, if, if, if you left or something, then the prayer is invalid. And so if you're able to redress whatever you miss from the fard, then you do a seho, you redress it, do the seho, and the prayer is valid. Unless it's the niyat, unless it's takbirat al-ihram, which I mentioned a couple of days ago. Somebody asked me if they make up the prayer again. And the only time you would do that if you, if you miss the takbirat al-ihram, the niyyah of doing the prayer. When you went into the prayer, you didn't have any niyyah in the prayer. Uh, then, then you would have to do it. Yeah, for a fard. Yeah, because it's an obligation. Yeah, if you don't, yeah, if you didn't do. Well, that's it. It just depends on if people are in a total state of heedlessness. Do you know, there are people are like that. You know, some people aren't even thinking about what they're doing. I mean, there's people in those states. You know, so if you're not in that state, that's good. But there are people in those states. You know. Yeah, adad. What is that? Yeah, adad. No. Yeah, adadu sunan al-thamani. Uh-huh. Adadu. Huh? What's that? What's that? No, adadu. Because it's marfu'a. Adadun. Yeah. Unless you did like, Allahumma uh, salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad adada. Yeah, that's different. Then it's mansub. Yeah. If it's... Because you're asking him, Salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Adada. Right? Yeah. It's mansub. That's marfu'a. Yeah. Because it's adadun. Iddatun wa adadun. So that's adadu sunan al thamani. And then that's mudaf ilayhi. So that's why it's majroor. So then the second one is if you forget to do a fadila, right? A fadila, the mandubat. Like qunut. Qunut is not a sunnah, it's a fadila. So if you forgot to do qunut or the, uh, or the uh, tahmid, you know, one, right? Uh, or something like that. فَلَا sujud عَلَيْهِ There's no sujood for that. So whenever you uh, do something like that, if it's before the salam, the prayer is invalid if you did it before the salam as a qabli. So you should do it from the beginning. And the only takbirah that you would do sehu for if you missed one was for the Eid prayer. So if the imam, because we have seven takbirah in the first rakah and five in the second. If the imam missed one of those, then they do sehu because each one is a sunnah mu'akkadah. Or you forget to do, uh, and then the third category. So here's three categories. Fard, Fadila, or Sunnah Khafifa, and then the, uh, the Sunnah Mu'akkadah. So he says for that, you do sajda for them. So the Sunan that you do, uh, I just mentioned in the Surah, right? The after, the Fatiha, in the first uh, two rakats. And then the Jahar and the Sir is one in their proper places. Takbiratani, from the, uh, the takbir uh, the, as you move through. Tasmi'atani, right, or the tahmidatani, saying the sami' Allahu liman hamida. Or one tasmi'ah with one takbira also. So 
So if you missed a tasmi'a and a takbira, if you, you, those two also. And then tashahud al-awwal, tashahud al-thani, and then sitting for the first one. So those are your eight categories. And then uh, if you omitted something, it's before salam. And if it's, a, uh, if it's a commission, it's after the salam. If you get the two together, then it's which one? So always the, the, the stronger one is, is omitting something. Doing too much is not as bad as doing too little. Right? In everything. So, uh, except for sin. Yeah. So, and then if you forget... Uh, but if you did the ba'di... Uh, and you should have done a qabli, it's good. Because like, like I said, you don't, there's no tashbir of saho. If you, if you make saho in saho, it's, there's no rectifying it. All right? And then, uh, and then the, uh, if you forget to do a qabli, and then you do it uh, after you remember it, and it's not a long time, and you didn't do any, there's no hadath, right? Then, then you redress it. It's an obligation to do it. Uh, and uh, the prayer's invalid if it was three or more sunan. And then also he said that the, the amount of time between them would be urf, you know, if you didn't go out of the masjid, uh, or there wasn't a long period of time, you, you get a sense. Like if, you know, you sh it's something you should uh, get a sense of. Like if you don't feel comfortable, there's too much time elapsed, or you've left the masjid, then you should redo the prayer. If it was three or more. If if it wasn't, if it was two sunan khafifa or one or two sunan mu'akkada, then then uh, no. If it's two sunan. Uh, Khafifa or one sunnah mu'akkadah because the problem with sunnah mu'akkadah is they're murakkab. So if you missed two sunnah mu'akkadah, it's actually three sunan or more. Do you see what I mean? In other words, if you missed a surah, you also missed the sir or the jahar. Okay, so it, you always have to keep that in mind. So three or more sunan is, is what uh, uh, makes it uh, obligatory. So if you actually miss two sunan mu'akkadah, you're going to have more than three sunan because of the tarkib. Mm -hmm. When you do the ba'adi, you do a tasneem at the end? Yeah, you say assalamu alaikum, you do the Allahu Akbar, and then go back up, uh, Allahumma fili barhamni, Allahu Akbar, do the sajda, go back up, and then you do the tashahud and get, get out a second time. Or, I mean, the tashahud, you don't have to do it a second time. If you, you know, you do it or don't, but do the tashahud the second time and then go out. Or just ashadu an la ilaha illallah shan Muhammad rasulullah and then out. Mm -hmm. um, when is it too late to make the takbir? Like, say for example, you remember while you're in sujood that you didn't make takbir. Because you're in already. Because you, you don't go back to sunan once you, you've moved to a new... Because each station has its acts. That's not an act of where you are. You see what I mean? And once you've gone into the fard, because the sajda is a fard, you don't go back to the sunan. If you were remembering it on the way down and you hadn't gone into the position, that's fine. Even if you didn't do it at the outset and you're, you're almost down to sajda, then you, you can still do it, it's fine. But if you get into sajda, you don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, once you're out of a station, then the acts of the station are not redressed unless it's a fard. So for instance, if I'm in, if I'm in, uh, you know, if I'm in, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, and I don't do Fatiha, and then I go down to Rukua, I have to go back up. So I go back up and I do the Fatiha, all right, and, and redress that. But if I'm already out of that, the rukua. Now I've gone two. Then I have to redress the thing. So if you, you know, if you get. It's the same if you, if the imam gets ahead of you, 
then you lose your prayer with the imam. If, he, if, if you're not following the imam and he gets three moves ahead of you, you know, you're, you're out of his prayer. You're in your own prayer. If you owe the qabli and you're out of the prayer, then you do the qabli. As long as it's near, yeah, you do it as a badi. Yeah. Because what you're doing is istidraq. You're redressing the qabli. Yeah, so it's, it's redressing something that you missed. Yeah. And then he says, and whoever forgets, وَمَنْ سِيَا قَبْلِي سَجَدُهُ إِذَا ذَكَرَهُ أَوْ لَمْ يَطُولُ أَوْ يُحْدَثُ فَإِنْ طَالَ أَوْ أَحْدَثَ بَطُرَ صَرَاتُهُ إِذَا كَانَ السُّجُودُ مُتَرَتِّبًا عَنْ نَقْسٍ عَنْ نَقْسِ ثَلَاثِ سُنَنًا فَأَكْثَرُ So if it's three or more sunan, uh, then, you, then you have to do it. If it's, uh, you have to make up the prayer. And then he said, يُعْتَبْرَ الطُّولَ الَّذِي تَبْطُرُ الصَّلَاةِ So it's, it's seen as urf. You know, it's, there's no fixed time. They don't say a minute and a half or two minutes. They just say, طول, you know, that you get some idea of that you've been away from the thing. And then the, the صِفَتُهُ سُجُودُ the sahu is two sajda, uh, no more, uh, and no less. Uh, you, ha you, you do a niyyah for it in the ba'di, wujuban. And in the qabli, you don't need to do a niyyah. But in the... In, if, once you're out of the prayer to do the badi, you have that niya when you go in to do the. the and then the, because uh, cause in the in, in the in the in the badi, technically you're out of the prayer. Yes, because you've said the salam, you've gotten out of the prayer, and then you're you're doing that to redress some something in the prayer. You see, so that's why it needs a new niya. Whereas with the qabli, you're, you're still in the prayer. And you're redressing the thing. All right? And then the, the takbir. Uh, right. And then he says, يَتَشَهَدُ فِي الْبَعْدِ كَتَشَهَدَ الْجُلُوسَ الْأَوَّلِ وَهُوَ السُنَّةِ uh, and also, وَكَذَارِكِ يَتَّشَهُدْ فِي الْقَبْلِ إِلَّا أَنْهُ إِذَا سَجِدَ قَبْلَ التَّشَهُدْ جَاز أو أَجْزَأَ تَشَهُدْ الْجَلْسَ عَنْ تَشَهُدْ السَّهُ So it's, you know, it, the tashahud is a sunnah, but if you don't do it, you know, you, the sahu is fine. But it is a sunnah to do the, the second tashahud in the, in the thing. And then, سَلَامْ فِي الْبَعَدِ وَاجِبٌ غَيْرُ شَرْقٌ وَفِي الْقَبْلِ يُجْزِي سَلَامَ الصلاة عنه والجهر بالسلام سنة في القبل والبعد ولا يدعو في البعد ولا يطيل. So the salam in the in the بعدي is an obligation, right? But not a شرط. In other words, it's it's uh, you know it's still valid. If you forgot to do the salam, it's still valid. Okay. Um, and then in the in the uh, in the قبل, the salam of the prayer suffices it to get out of it. And then it's also سنة to do the جهر. Of the salam, salam alaikum, in 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 when you're redressing these wrongs, and then uh, in the the ma'mum, if you're being led, you should do sajda with the imam in his sahu for a qabli, uh, if you got more than a rakat with him, either adraka ma'hu rakat fa akthar. So if if you got a rakat with the imam, you should do the qabli with him. You don't do the badi. You do that after. But the qabli, you do it with him. And if that's the case, uh, if, 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 uh, if, you, if you didn't get the rakat with him and you do it, then your prayer is invalid. All right? What do you mean? Yeah, exactly. Because your... Say you come in and he's in the last julus, right? He's doing the qabli. Your prayer is actually, you missed his prayer. Yeah, so you don't have his prayer. So, so if, if the ma'mum forgets, 
عَمَّا يُجِبِ السُّجُودِ لَمْ يَسْجُودِ وَيَحْمِرُهُ الْإِمَامُ عَنْهُ So, uh, if the ma'mum forgets anything, he doesn't do a sujood, because the imam carries his prayer, any mistakes he makes. Unless it's arkan. If it's one of the arkan of the prayer, the fara'id, the sasiya, then he doesn't carry that. وَمَنْ سَهَا يُسَبَّحْ لَهُ If somebody forgets, you say subhanallah for him. And it's also permissible for the imam and the ma'mum uh, to ask a question and to answer it. It's, you know, did I only pray three rakat? He can say that. And they can say yes. And then he gets up and does it. If he needs clarification. So that's permissible. Yeah. The Prophet asked the man, Is, does everybody agree with him? They said yes. And so the Prophet redressed the prayer. Yeah. Also, the hukam, the sujood al sahu is a sunnah if you leave a sunnah mu'akkada, right? Uh, or if you uh, leave two light sunan. And wajibun if you leave three sunan, whether they're mu'akkada or other than mu'akkada. So the sujood uh, for leaving a fadila is. Um, If you do a sujood for leaving a fadila or more, then your prayer is invalid if it was before the salam. And the the wala yajbar sujood al salah idha naqasa. So you don't have to do the uh, the sujood if there was a uh, you know a lot. No, if the the uh, if you miss a fard, your the sahu is not going to redress that fard. You have to come with the fard and then do the sahu. If you just do the sahu without the fard, it doesn't redress it. Uh, and then he, he, he gives some examples of if you get up for man qamin raka'atin fi salatin ruba'iyya, if you do uh, uh, and you forget to do the julus, sahwan. You go back to the julus as long as you haven't left the earth with, with both hands and knees. That's an important one because that's a common one people m do mistake. So if you're in the julus, you know, you, you, you've gone down to your second uh, tekbi, uh, you know, sajda, and you're coming out and, and you get off to here and you remember, oh, I didn't do the julus, you go back down and you do your tashahud. That's in the first one. But if you go to here and now you're off, hands off, you've moved in to the fard. So you just keep going up. You don't go back down. If you go back down, you, now you have uh, what? What do you owe if you go back down? Uh, ba'di. A ba'di, yeah, because you've done more in the prayer. You didn't omit. So you did your julus, but you still owe a ba'di because you, you did that extra movement. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't do the ba'di with him. Yeah. You do the ba'di at the end of your prayer. Mm -hmm. Cuz he's getting out of the prayer. See, he's on he's in another action that's extraneous to your prayer. He's out. That's why you don't follow him. He has a niya for that because he's now out of his prayer. And if, so if you do it with him, you, you're doing an action outside of the prayer. But I do the ba'di yeah, you would do the ba'di after you finish the prayer. Uh-huh. Um, one of the late sunnahs is to do salawat on the Prophet. Right. And that fulfills everything like the, the shortest, like the same, the Allah and the Qariyah. Well, the, the sunnah is the salah al-Ibrahimiyah. Yeah. And Imam Shafi'i says it's a fard. So it's better to do it khurujan an al-khilaf. You know, that's getting, it's mustahab to get out of khilaf. Generally, unless it means doing a makru in your uh, madhab.
You see, so like Ahmed ibn Hanbal has two salam to get out of the prayer. But for us, that, that's, that's not a sunnah. Whereas the tashahud is a sunnah, but if somebody says it's fard, then you should really do it. Do you see what I mean? That's the difference. So if, if there's something that another imam in another madhab says that emphasizes, like it says something that's sunnah in your madhab is fard in his madhab, then you, sh you should, it's good to get out of that khilaf. Yeah. Whereas if it's something they say you should do, but in your madhab it's makru to do, you don't, that's not, yeah, that's not. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, no, you still join the prayer with them. He might get up for a rakat that he missed. You know, there, there's a, uh, you still. There's khayr even in that little baqiyah. Mm -hmm. You got the rakah as long as he hasn't gone out of ruku'ah. Once he's out of ruku'ah, moving up to the standing position, you miss the rakah. As long as you got him in his tuma'nina of the ruku'ah, then you got the rakah. That's why it's called raka. It's not called qiyam. The raka is from ruku'a. So as long as you get the ruku'a, you got the raka. Do you see? It is important, but he did the fatiha for you. <laughs> you know, the imam does your fatiha. Unless you're shafi, I don't know if they might have another ruling about that. You know, because they have to do the Fatiha. I don't know. But the Malikis know. Mm -hmm. Can you do the, 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 the two tafsirs that you might miss? Yeah. Can you do that all the way up until the very end of that movement? Yeah, that's what I was saying. As long as you're not in to the next station, you, can, the, you can do the takbir and, and it's a takbir. So, for instance, the sunnah is to do the takbir at the outset. All right, so Allahu Akbar, I do my fatiha, I do my surah, Allahu Akbar. But as I'm moving down, and then I realize, and then I say Allahu Akbar, before I've gotten into that, it's, that's fine. You, you, you did your takbir. So if, you came, if you came to a rest... Then you're in the next station. Okay. Yeah, so you missed it. Just like as I'm coming out, I get up here, and then I realize that I haven't done it. Because now you're in another station, so you've missed it. But that's with the exception of the one. With the exception of the 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 yeah, because that is the the point of saying the Allahu Akbar once you get back to the standing position. So with that one, could you save that one all the way into the third to the third rakah? No. Yeah, it's before you start into the next. So the other one, you say it while moving. Yeah, well, as you're. As long as you're not into the next station, right? Because that, because that's the, uh, you know, then then you it applies to the next thing that you're in, the takbir for that. Which is the whole third qiyam, you could say the takbir, and it would still count that takbir from getting up from the first two. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the sujood station is when your hands are full. Yeah, once you once you're you're in that station. Yeah. So when you go into Fajr, are you going knees first or hands first? Uh hands first and hands last. Hands first, hands last. So first on, last off. And then he says uh
if you leave your prayer and then you remember that you have something owing, like a ruku' or a sujood, فَلْيَرْجِعْ وُجُوبًا لِيَتْمَامِ الصَّلَاةِ You have to go back wujuban to finish your prayer. إِذَا كَانَ تَذَكُرُهُ قَرِيبًا مِنْ صَرَافِي مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ مَا لَمْ يَطُولْ أَوْ يَخْرُجْ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ As long as it wasn't too long, it was close to the prayer, and you haven't left the masjid. وَرُجُوعُهُ يَكُونُ بِتَكْبِيرَةٍ يُحْرِمُ بِهَا نَاوِيًا إِتْمَامَ مَا بَقِي مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ But so you go do the takbir again to come back into the prayer and, and complete what you've made. وَيُنْدِبْ لَهُ رَفْعُ يَدَيْهِ So it's mandub to raise the hands again. وَيَرْجِعُ إِلَى الْحَالَ الَّتِي فَارَقَ الصَّلَاةِ فِيهَا And then you go back to whatever position that, uh, that you left. Like if you left ruku' so يَرْجِعُ قَائِمًا وَتَارِكُ sajda يَجْلِسُ And then you do the sajda. وَتَارِكُ الرَّفْعَ مِنَ الرُّكُوعَ يَرْجِعُ مَحْدَوْدِبًا So you go back into that position of ruku' وَإِنْ كَانَ سَلَّمَ مِنَ الثَّنَتَيْنِ رَجَعْ إِلَى الْجُلُوسِ وَأَحْرَمَ مِنْهُ So وَإِنْ كَانَ سَلَّمَ مِنْ رَابِعَ أَوْ ثَالِثَ So if you did, if you, you know, if you were in a, if you did salam after two rakats, uh, then you go to the julus and then do the ihram and go back up and do the finish the two rakats or the third if it's maghrib. Uh, and if you did, uh, so then in redressing those, you've done that and then yeshud lisahu. Then you do your sujud lisahu after that. What's that? Yeah, yeah. No, you do, your knee is to redress what you missed from the prayer, but you do the takbirah to haram to get back into the prayer. You go to the julus and then go up, and then Allahu Akbar, yeah. And وَمَنْ نَسِيَ السَّلَامُ وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْهُ حَتَّى طَالَ طُولًا مُتَوَسِطًا بَيْنَ الْقُرْبِ وَالْبُعْدَ وَفَارَقَ مَوْضِعُهُ بَيْنَهُ يَرْجِعُ جَالِسًا وَيَحْرَمُ مِنْ جُلُوسٍ وَيُعِيدَ التَّشَهُدٍ So whoever forgets the salam, وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْهُ حَتَّى طَالَ طُولًا مُتَوَسِطًا And it's been, you know, a modern amount of time. It's not too close, not too far. Uh, or you left the position you were in, so you go back to the julus position. You do your ihram from the julus, Allahu Akbar, you go back into the prayer. Will you eat the tashahud, do your tashahud over, and then you do the salam. And then you do the sajda after the salam. He's giving the most common examples that people do. That's what's useful about this. Uh, and then, وَمَنْ يَدْرِي بَعَدْ إِتْمَامِ صَرَاتِهِ سَلَّمَ أَوْ لَمْ يُسَلَّمْ If you don't know whether you did your salam or didn't do it, and you think a little bit, well, you said them what is sujood alay. So just do your salam, and there's no sujood on you. Wa mizruhu lo shakka hal saha an shay am lam yasu wa tafkara qadiyan thumma tabayyan adam sahuhi wa mahlu adam sujood haytu kana qariban wa yinharif an al qibla. So if you have doubt and you're thinking, did I or didn't I, and then you realize, no, I didn't do anything, and you haven't moved away from your sujood, there's nothing on you. If you haven't moved away from your qibla. There's nothing on you. وَنَمْ يُفَارَقْ مَكَانَهُ فَيْنَنْ حَرَفَ عَنْهُ سَجَدْ But if you've moved away from it, you do the sahu. Uh, and then finally, shak in the prayer. This is the last section that he gives. الْأَصْرُ فِي هَذِي الْمَسَلَى قَوْلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِذَا شَكَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي صَرَاتِهِ فَلَمْ يَدْرِي كَمْ صَلَّى ثَلَاثًا أَوْ أَرْبَعًا فَلْيَطْرَحِ الشَّك so the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever doubts in his prayer, did I do three or four, let him cast out his doubt and build on what he's certain. So we always build on certainty. Yubna ala al-yaqeen. That's the qaida, always. If you're, if you're doubtful, you know, لا يزول اليقين بالشك. That's one of the qawaid al-khams in fiqh. Uh, doubt does not, certainty is not eliminated by doubt. You always build on what you're certain of.
All right. So if you're certain you were in wudu and then you doubt you lost your wudu, but if you knew that you you if had didn't have you you lost wudu, but you're doubting whether or not you did it after, then you have to do the wudu. It's like that. So you always yaqeen is the basis. All right. Doubt is what you get rid of because doubt is uh, just to give you you know this is important too. So you understand this. There, there's uh, doubt in, 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 in all, we have one yaqeen, yaqeen, all right, certainty, and then one, which is uh, opinion, and then shek, which is doubt, and then uh, uh, one knocks. and then waham. Okay, uh, you you have you have uh, sh- sh- on on a scale check is right here. You don't know if you did it, you don't know if you didn't do it. That's shak. Yaqeen is your certainty that you did it. So that scale goes up. Certainty is it. One is, you know, it's the, in knowledge you have facts and you have opinions. Opinions are you know, they could be right or wrong, but a good opinion is built on something, right? When you have an opinion about something, like I think Obama is a better candidate than... That's an opinion. This is not certainty, it's an opinion. Because certainty is what everybody agrees on, right? But you can give your arguments, and then the person who gives his arguments, and, and, and an intelligent person who listens to both of them, you know what? His opinion makes more sense to me. So opinion is real. Like in Islam, we give credence to opinion. It's not a bad thing to have an opinion. But it should be based on rational arguments, intelligence. So that's, and that's why ghadib al is important. Because ghadib al which is a preponderant opinion, it's a strong opinion, can reach the level of yaqeen in sharia. So for instance, if it's a cloudy day and you can't see the sunset, you wait until you have ghalib al and, and, that, and that's yaqeen, because you didn't see the sun go down. And you don't have a watch, okay? And you don't have your prayer time, I, I pray, you know, thing on your Google, whatever. So you're out and... and and you see, it's cloudy, you can't see, but it's, it looks like it's Maghrib. So you have Ghadib al you can pray with Ghadib al Yaqeen is where you're certain, there's no doubt. You see the sun go down, you saw it on the horizon, it's gone. All right? So, and then Waham is, it's just, there's no basis for it. Waham. There's no basis for it. It's, it's like, it doesn't exist. This is waham. No basis. That's what waham. And people have waham, but there's no basis for it. So th- this is the way you, in sharia, it's shak is right in between. And that's why shak, you don't give shak any weight when, when you have yaqeen. Al yaqeen la yazulu bi shak. Because, you know, you're certain about something, so you don't let the doubt come in and try to. Because that, that, that's like shaitan. You know, somebody's certain about God, shaitan likes to come and bring in, you know, get you start doubting. That, that, that's, so you don't listen to doubt. So that's the basis of the masada. And then, فَلْيَقِيَ الشَّكُ وَرِيَبْنِ عَلَى الْيَقِينَ in a riwayah. So he says, فَإِنَ اسْتَيَقَنَ التَّمَامَ سجد سجدتين فإن كانت صلاة تامة كانت الركعة نافلة وسجدتان نافلة 
وإن كانت ناقصة كانت الركعة تمام الصلاة والسجدتان ترغمان أنف الشيطان فمن لم يدري ما صلى أثلاث ركعات أم أربعا مثلا فإنه يبني على الأقل So you should always build if you think did I do three or four you build on three and then you complete the fourth one and then you do the sahu after the salam because you might have done uh, five yeah and you didn't omit anything that's why you do the ba'di and then وَمَنْ لَازَمُ الشَّكْ وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَأْتِيهِ فِي كُلِّ صَلَاءِ أو في كل وضوء. now if you're what's called you have مستنكح الشك somebody who is, is always has it's more Swiss somebody who's like a you know in a state of obsessive compulsive if you if you have that problem it is a problem but if, if somebody has that then it's the opposite that you you build on your doubt and and and, and the beauty of that is it's actually targhim in the shaitan you know because it's actually a treatment for the problem so you build on your doubt not on your certainty It, it, it should be at least once a day. In, in, in one of your prayers, you make that mistake. It happens every day. If it's, if it's not more than once a day, it's not, it's, you, you're not in that category. Some people have it in every prayer, you know, Sallam I mean, there's people that have that. Mm-hmm. So if you are certain you completed a mm-hmm. but you have doubt that you may have, have um, missed a part in it, like, Right. Does that make the Rakah valid because that's what you're certain about? Or you completed the Rakah? Yeah, no, you're certain. Okay. You always, you, you build on your certainty. If you're uncertain about it. Yeah, but he has, a, he's a, it's a doubt. Yeah. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to have a basis again for what what you're doing. And I've been like, you know, in like the third raka, and I'm like, can I just go straight into sajda in the first raka? You know, like, so I can't, you know, I'm not really sure because it didn't really pop into my head till later. So in that case, we just complete the prayer. And if you did your, yeah, if you did your, uh, you know, you're certain you did the raka, and then you start to have doubt about something in. The rakat. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. No, you, you would build on what, what you're certain of. Yeah. So if you didn't, uh, if you didn't, if you think that you missed something in there, then you have to redress it. Because you're not certain of it. Then you redress it only if you're certain. No. In other words, whatever you're certain of is what you what you have if if you if you if you doubt something and it's real shek of it like if i'm doubting that i uh i know that i did the rakat but i'm now i'm doubting my ruku'a then you have to redress your ruku'a like that because you don't know you, you what you have is your certainty Unless you're more Swiss, right? If you're more Swiss, then then it's only what you know. You, you ignore that. So that's the section on the uh, on the sahu. Uh huh. You 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 what did you forget? Yeah, that's that's not. Uh, I mean, Imam Malik, Rabbi Allah, doesn't, 
uh, he doesn't do any of the sujood in the prayer, but that that's mandub, yeah. It's not a wajib, so if you didn't do that. And he doesn't, in the far prayer, it's makru to, to do that if you're uh, an imam and you're reciting, because it confuses people. You know, people come in and they find the imams in sajda, they don't know where he is. Even on Friday, Alif Lam Mim Sajda, which is a sunnah according to the other imams, they always do it in the haram. But people get confused every time. If you're in the haram on Friday morning, when they do that sujood as sahil always people get confused. Because a lot of people don't know that ruling. Because you, you, know, you have ignorant people in there. My wife said in the women's section it's a disaster. Because she said half of them are still in Rukua. And the other half are in Sajda. You know, so it's a real problem that. So you should avoid the... And then Malik only... He has 11 points of Sajda, Imam Malik. He has none in the Mufassal. So like Iqra at the end of... Uh, there's no Sahu. In, I mean, there's no Sujood in that. Imam Malik doesn't have any sujood in those, uh, the last portion of the Quran. You know, the last. Uh... So, um, Oh, you know, one thing that's useful also, if you do do a, uh, you know, uh, if you're doing nafila prayers, then, and you, and, and, and you, and you, and you pray two, and then you go up for the third, then you do the, the four, and then do a qabli. Like that. For the nafila. Because you missed a salam between the two. Yeah. What do you mean? If, if, if you lay into a parent and you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh-huh. Does that, does that um, somehow uh, invalidate? No. Or? No, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a, you're just leaving a, you know, a, a, a mandub in the Maliki Metab. I mean, it's not, it's not a big deal that, you know. But obviously that hadith of Zuhri shows you that it was a strong practice. Because he, when he saw the man doing it, he's like, where would you get that from? You know, it wasn't something that they were used to in Medina. I mean, he probably knew it existed, you know. I don't doubt that. He might have just been giving the guy a hard time or who knows, you know. But uh, they were, you know, in Medina, they were very consistent about practicing the amal, and they did not like people to bring in things into Medina from other places. Uh, Yahya ibn Yahya al-Layfi mentions that when he was on his way from Andalusia to, uh, to Medina to study with Malik, you know, he said there was a man on their caravan who was, uh, he used to get up and tell stories uh, and make everybody cry after the prayers. Like he was, you know, it's kind of like Jama'at Tabliq. If somebody got up and he's like, and it was nice and people get affected by it and they would cry. And Yahya was very moved by this, you know. But then when he got to Medina, the man got up after the prayer. They were in the Masjid of the Prophet. And uh, he started doing this and he said people started throwing sandals at him. <laughs> so he was very shocked by it, you know, because like he's just doing raqa'iq and... And uh, Yahya asked somebody, why, why are they doing that? And he said, Malik doesn't allow for any storytellers in the, in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because for him, the masjid was a place of ilm. It wasn't really a place. Wa'al was for Friday, but it wasn't really a place to tell stories and, you know... <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh huh. Yeah. What's that? To do for what? Yeah, then you would do you would do a qabli because you omitted the salam. Qabli is yeah, it's for omission. Commission is ba'di. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now we're at the Friday congregational prayer. Did we do that already? We did, yeah. So now, did we do Sunan al Jumu'ah? Uh, Mandubat al Jama'ah? Okay, Wunujbat i'adat al Fadhi biha la maghriban kada ishan mutiruha. So it's recommended for an individual to repeat a prayer that he's performed alone if he finds a congregation doing it, unless it's Maghrib uh, or Isha in which he's performed with her. If he didn't do with her, he can repeat Isha. So technically, the only prayer you don't repeat in Jama'ah is Maghrib. If you find a Jama'ah, you pray, say you prayed Dhuhr on your own, and then you come and there's a group doing Dhuhr, it's good to repeat the prayer. You, you can't lead the prayer. If the only one you don't do is Maghrib, and if you prayed Isha and did Witr after Isha, then you don't do a, a, a prayer again, Isha again. And the Prophet said, don't pray the same prayer twice in a day, and this is the only exception. You know, And he was doing that because some people will think, oh, I need to pray because my prayer wasn't good enough, or you know, and you get into obsessional behavior like that. What's that? Yeah, so now we're on the Imam, Shurut al Imam. Alright? So the uh, the Imam should be legally responsible. He should be a male. And I mentioned Ibn Ayman relates from Malik that Imam Malik permitted women to lead the prayer for the Malikis. That that but that's a weak opinion. It's supported by the hadith, Aisha and uh, 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 um Salama used to lead the prayer for the women. That's established. Also, Um Haram uh, led the prayer for women. Uh, uh, Imam al, al-, 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 al- Mazani from the Shafi'i Nathab. And he's one of the big Shafi'i scholars. He's the He was a student, direct student of Imam Shafi'i. His sister was a student of Imam Shafi'i. His sister is the mother of Imam al Tahawi, who wrote the Tahawiyya. And his mother, who's the sister of Imam Namazani, was uh, Ed Muzani. Yeah. Was uh, she was a uh, mushtahida in the Shafi'i Madhab, so very learned family. But he was of the opinion that women could lead the prayer, uh, could lead men in prayer, and that's the opinion of Imam Tabari. It was the opinion of. Uh, um, uh, Ibn Arabi also. So th- there was an opinion. Ibn Taymiyyah permits it, uh, women leading the prayer, if the, the men are illiterate and uh, the woman is a uh, alima, that he permitted it for nafila, he didn't permit it for fard. So she could lead them in tarawih. Uh, but he said she led from behind, not from front. So anyway, I wrote a paper called uh, Can Women Be Imams um, that was published in... Uh, in uh, seasons, is that on the line? Is it? Because we should put that up if it's not. Anyway, that that gives you all the various opinions about it. But the uh, you know the mashhur of the madhab is that women cannot lead the prayer for other women. They pray on their own. If they do, the woman leads the prayer from the from the first line. If if you're in a place and the women uh, are going to pray in congregation, if you join the congregation, the prayer is valid. It's valid to pray uh, behind uh, the mushtahid of another uh, madhab. What's that? 
then you always would stand on the on the uh, on the right of the the imam. If there's only one, you stand on the right. The Prophet Sallallahu Ibn Abbas once prayed, you know, he used to pray with him and he would get on the left. He was a little boy, so he would get on the left. The Prophet would take his ear and pull him around to the right side. <laughs> so, and so, able to fulfill all the pillars of the prayer, so he should be able to stand, bow, prostrate. You know, he shouldn't be handicapped, something where he couldn't fulfill the pillars. And then he should know ahkam al salah. So you should always put, in Malik's madhab, you put, when it says, aqra'uhum li kitabillah, you know, the people that read best the Book of Allah, the Malikis interpret that to mean afqahuhum, the most learned. Because the Qari was a learned person. If you look in the early hadith, the Qurra are the learned people. They're not, they're not it doesn't mean like, a, like today we have Quran reciters, that's all they know. And there's people that, memorize the Qur'an and their Qadi, but they don't know any, if you ask them basic things, they don't know them. So that's not what it's meant. In Malik's madhab, it's the most learned in fiqh, uh, even though they might not uh, know the Qur'an as well as a Qadi. They should still, they're preferred, afqahuhum. Uh, that's his position. Especially in the prayer, I mean, that's all they need to know, if they know the ahkam of salah. But if they're, if they're ignorant of the fiqh, they, you know, they're carrying your prayer. So if, if they're ignorant, they don't know the niyyah, they don't know the istikhlaf, they don't know what to do if they go into uh, like a sehu problem. They, you know, so they have to know how to pray those things. And then free from deviance in creed and deed. Uh, you know, in other words, they should not be fasiqun bil jarihati o bil aqidah. Bil jariha means they're doing something like they're known to drink, uh, you know, in the older books, they say they shave the beard. Uh, I wouldn't apply that today, personally. I mean, the Mauritanians, a lot of them do. The people I studied with, they... But in Mauritania, you know, until very recently, people, everybody grew beards. So it would make sense in an environment like that. There are weak opinions in, in all the madhabs. I, I don't know about Hanafi, I shouldn't say that. But there are weak opinions in the Maliki and the Shafi'i madhab that, that the beard is, is a sunnah. It's not a fault. So, you know, that, that's the opinion of some of the Malikis. Um, so, you know, you make excuses for people. Maybe he's following that opinion. He maybe is a mujtahid. You know. Oh, it is? It's online? Yeah. So you, if, you, if you want, if you're interested in that, on the Imam for Women article, it is on, on the line. Uh, and then, free from having faulty... Arabic pronunciation. Tajweed is a fard. To recite the Fatiha and the Surah with Tajweed is an obligation. If you don't, if you don't do the Tajweed, it's sinful. And at least now you don't need to know the ahkam of Tajweed. What's called tafasil is a fard kifaya. So to know like this is a ghunna and this is you know idgham bila ghunna that this is qalqala or you know this is ikhfa like those specific rules uh, you don't like if somebody asks you you know why do you say why do you say why didn't you say you know why do you say it that way and they don't know that that's fine as long as they did it properly right so sirajan uh, wahaja you know they don't know that's idgham but they, they don't say sirajan wahaja. They don't pronounce that noon. As long as they come with the idgham, then they're fulfilling the obligation. They don't have to know that that's what it is. All right? So if somebody can recite that. Now there's lahn khafi and lahn jali. Lahn khafi, most of the ulama say that, you know, if they, if they have a lahn jali, like, if, if it's a, an egregious lahan, like they say, you know, walad zalin, that's jelly. Like nobody's going to debate that, you know. And th then their prayer is valid for them, but not for others. And so the ulama differ. Some of them say, if nobody knows tajweed, they should all pray on their own. Yeah, because nobody should. You know, you're putting somebody forward, and he's 
supposedly taking the prayer of the others, but his prayer is invalid, technically, because he can't pronounce the Fatiha properly. So if that's his excuse, it's his personal excuse. It's not an excuse for the others. So that's, that's the idea behind that, that he should do the prayer, everybody should do the prayer on their own. That's one opinion, you know. Um, so basically, they should have a, a good thing. Some of them say, as long as they don't, you know, even if they don't come with the ahkam al tajweed as they are, but they, they, the, the maharij and the sifat are correct, then it's valid. Now, one of the nice things about the Fatiha is there's like, there's, there's only, what, what ruling is in Fatiha? What's that? That's it. Yeah, Surah. Yeah, Surah al ladina You know. So there's only Tafkhim in the, in the Fatiha. What a ba, you know, ba is Tafkhim. Huh? And mad, yeah. But they're not, they're not related. It's a mad lazim. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Everybody does it anyway, because that's the way everybody learned the Fatiha. I think so. You don't think so? Oh, really? Okay. You know, there's whole books written on that subject. Uh, in, in the Fatiha, the nice thing is that the, there's qiraat that have the sad as seen. Sirat, and then there's a qiraat between sad and between... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's like a zay, zirat al-mustaqim. But people make big mistakes, like they'll do like... إِهْدِنَا سِرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And then they'll stop and then they'll say أَسْسِرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ You know, the, the, you know they'll, they'll do things because they're used to it. Like if you do it, إِهْدِنَا سِرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ أَسْسِرَاطَ So you've got that A ah, because of the Fatha. So they'll do like إِهْدِنَا سِرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ أَسْسِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ You know, those are like major mistakes because it's a complete mispronunciation of the Qur'an. You know. It changes the meaning. So if you have tahrif al-ma'ani, you're in a whole other, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, no, fatiha is the key thing. You know, but if they're making like i'rab problems, then they're just jahil. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of learned people that can't pronounce the Qur'an very well. Like, Pakistan's filled with the ulama that make mistakes. Morocco, I mean, I've seen some like giants, real, real, I mean, just run rings around most of the ulama walking around today. And, and they have bad Quranic pronunciation because they're old school. That Tajweed is a new, it's been revived in the last 30 years. So if you meet some of these older, like 70-year-old Moroccans, I mean, they recite the Quran abominably. You know, really. Tulletun you know, min al you know. That's the way they pronounce it. But they know if you ask them the ahkam, if you ask them sifat al tha, they'll give all the sifat al huru. Oh yeah, no, they know all the ahkam. They, they didn't learn it. You know, they, there was no tatbiq. I mean, if you listen to the Quran reciters on the radio in Morocco from the 1950s and 60s, they all mispronounce the Qur'an. I mean, the king's reciter, you know, it's terrible pronunciation. They're great recitations. I mean, I love them because they've got these nice nagham and, you know, but the, the actual tajweed is not there. I mean, tajweed's been revived in, Mecca bin Qur'an revived it in Morocco. It was revived in this generation. It's only the last 20 years that Moroccans have really taken tajweed seriously, but now they're starting to win the competition. Mauritanians have better tajweed than Moroccans. But they make, you've heard like, you know, Sheikh Saleh, Rami, they don't pronounce the, you know, because cause they, it's, you know, they don't have that. I mean, they actually consider it, some of the Mauritanians consider it tekelluf. 
Like they really see it as tekelov. It's too much, the Eastern thing. They think it's too much, but I mean, it's not true. It, yeah, it's not true. Because it's Bedouin, you know, they're Bedouin, so they, they take the, they've got the bare minimum. I mean, they do, they recite properly, but they don't have the level of tajweed that you find in Cairo or Syria or something like that. But they, they're fuqaha, I mean, that's the difference. <laughs> like, they know it all, you know. So, I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu said one of the signs at the end of time, he said, is that, he said, Antum, uh, you know, he said, Antum, uh, Qaleerun Qura'ukum, Kahirun Fuqaha'ukum. You know, there, there's not many Qur'an reciters amongst you, but there's a lot of Fuqaha. He said, Tuhafiduna Hudud al-Qur'an wa Tudayyuna Hurufuhu. You know, you, you're, you know the meanings of the Qur'an and you guard those uh, Hudud, and, and you, but you're not as vigilant about the, uh, the like, Tajweed. And he said, Sayyati ala ummati zaman, Kathirun Qurra'uhum. Their their Quran reciters are many. Qalilun Fuqaha'uhum. And their their fuqaha are few. Yuhafiduna Hurufuhu wa Yudayuna Hududuhu. They guard the exact measures of the, the, the letters, but they don't apply the rulings. And that's a clear mu'jiza of the Prophet because we're our ummah is filled with people that are masters of tajweed. I mean, there, and now you've got taxi drivers because of Al-Husari and all these people. You know, I mean, I've heard Egyptian, really, you know, uneducated Egyptians, and they recite perfect Quran because they listen to the all day long and they, they do it. They do it. So they're getting talaqi without really knowing it. You know, they're really taking it from masters. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's uh, important. And then, uh, in the process of following another imam, or having followed another imam for the prayer, he intends to lead. Yeah, so in your istikhlaf, or on Jumu'ah, you have to make the intention of the niyyah of imamah. From Khalil, uh, he should be accepted by most of the congregation. The Prophet ﷺ cursed people who prayed, and 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 the congregation did not like them. So it's not good to have an imam that nobody likes, unless the reason they don't like him is because, like he yamur bil ma'ruf yanha an al munkar. You know, if he if he's like telling them things they shouldn't be doing that they really shouldn't be doing, and that's why they don't like him, then it doesn't apply. But if he's got personality problems, and, and we do have imams like that where people just don't like them, then it's a problem. Yeah, that's recommended. And then be the head of a household that's in a private home. So people, you know, Rabb al-Manzil should lead the prayer unless there's a righteous person and he gives him permission. But the man, the righteous one or the learned man shouldn't just go ahead in somebody's house. You know, a, house, a man's house is his castle. He's the hakim in the house. And so, you know, somebody else should do that. Be put forward if a political leader. So the, the representation of government is put forward, like the imam, the governor, the wali. Even in Maliki fiqh, if you're traveling, you. Can, you, you don't lead the Jum'ah prayer, a musafir, unless they're a wali, if they're a governor, then they can do it. So that's how important that, that is. No, you can just do dhuhr. If you want, it, it's, it suffices. So if, you, if, you, if you're traveling and you go to Jum'ah, it suffices, your dhuhr. But you don't have to do it. It's not, it's not an obligation on you. And then be the most knowledgeable in fiqh, be the most knowledgeable in hadith, be the most devout, be the best reciter. So this is actually the way it goes down. This is, this is the way it's followed. Be the best reciter, be the most noble in lineage. So a descendant of the Prophet ﷺ. All things considered, like if the first eight are, you know, they're pretty much equal in it or something, or they're not there, then you go to the noblest in lineage. And that's the only no nobility of lineage we have is the al-bayt. 
Islam is egalitarian with that. You know, if, if you look on that yin-yang symbol, you know, in the yin, there's always a little white dot. In the yang, there's the, the white dot. And in the yin, there's a black dot. That's kind of like, in Islam, the egalitarian thing. And then there's that little, you know, aristocracy of, uh, of the al-bayt and the Quraysh. But other than that, there's no i'tibar in lineage. And then be the most handsome of countenance. Now people, you know, you can see that. That's real. You know, nice faces. The Prophet ﷺ said, seek dua with people with good faces. And uh, there, there's, you know, that's one of the shurut uh, al-kamal of leadership. Like leaders should have good faces. You want to put good faces forward because people are attracted by nature to good faces. And so you, leadership, you know, it's good to have people. Like people that go on TV as spokespeople for the Muslims, it's important to have people that are, you know, people don't, they're not like, yikes, you know, I mean, like, you know, he's got a, a eye patch and a hook and, you know, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> you know, it's going to scare people away, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is, I mean, it's something, it's real. You know, people can just by the way somebody looks, the way they're dressed, the way they talk, those things can be reasons why they're attracted naturally. And, and, and it's important for the community to recognize that, that the, there is a reality to that. And that's why that is part of that. There's a reason why the Prophet was the most beautiful person. I mean, people were attracted to him physically. And, and it, that attraction is, it's like, you know, it's like when you get married. You know, that's the first attraction. It's the most, it's the least significant in a marriage. But it's the first one, is generally. And that's why the Prophet said to the man when he was going to marry, he said, have you seen her? He said, no. And he said, go look at her because you have to have attraction. So he was, he was encouraging that aspect, you know, even in marriage, that you have to be physically attracted to your spouse. If you're not physically attracted, then it's, you know, it's going to be a little more difficult. But that is the least significant in a, in a solid marriage. That goes very quick, you know. I mean, it's like when, you know, when you, when you travel and you go home, you kind of realize that your wife's really pretty. You know, you don't really notice it every day because it's, it's, it's that thing of you, you get accustomed to something somebody, you know. Okay, and then have the best character. Khuluq. Be the best dress. You know, I mean, it's interesting our deen recognizes these things. This is in Mukhtasar Khalil. You know, be the best. Imam Malik kana labbasan. They said Imam Malik was an elegant dresser. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, I never saw anything more beautiful than that red uh, Yemeni jubba on the Prophet ﷺ. Like the Prophet had a red uh, jubba that he wore, and it was beautiful to look at. You know, they didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, the Sahaba were quite poor, but the Prophet liked nice things. When 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 uh, when Umm Habiba brought him the shirt from uh, Ethiopia, and he was the Prophet was international dresser because if you look, he has he has a Roman shirt that had. Like, they actually describe it as being puffy sleeves, but narrow, you know, so it was like a, it was a style. <laughs> he had a Roman shirt, he had that Yemeni jubba, he had the Ethiopian shirt, so he had his African clothes. And when Umm Habiba brought it, he looked at it and he said, Sena, you know, Sena, which in Ethiopian means, that's nice, you know. Some of the ulama use that as a proof that he knew all the languages, you yeah. But, but that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged good clothing, especially on Jum'ah. He liked white. He preferred white as, 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 a, as a garment. There were certain colors for men that he did not encourage, like a bright yellow, although they did wear yellow turbans, and the turbans on Badr were yellow, which is why the Moroccans wear yellow turbans. Imam uh, Sayyidina Hamza had a purple turban. Uh, he, had a, he had a black turban with the, the ostrich feather. Yeah, so he put his ostrich feather in his turban. <laughs> you know, the Native Americans, if it rained, they'd
call off the battle because the feathers would get. <laughs> you know, if you ever get that aspect of humans, you know. <laughs> yeah. The Arabs, you know, the Arabs in that they weren't they weren't like these bloodthirsty people. I mean, the, the uh, you know these battles were like five people would die. You know, they weren't these major. They just go out. People get wounded. But if you look at the numbers of people that died, I mean, they're, they're not large numbers. Even at Badr, even though the fighting was really intense, you know, if you look, it's, it's, uh, it's not that many people on both sides. Ahud, you know, look at the numbers. In, in the 23 years, less than 700 people died. That's it. And that pro- probably with Khaybar, which, you know, the the range is like 300 to 1100, which is pretty big. But Imam Malik did not accept Ibn Ishaq's narrations on Khaybar because they were, most of the people that related the numbers were Jewish converts. They were children that were at Khaybar. And he didn't accept the, uh, he didn't accept those. Because people always exaggerate the, uh, Atrocities, always. That's like a qaida in history. You can ask any historian. If you, if if you look at atrocities, the group that was aggressed on always exaggerates numbers. That's just a qaida. It's very hard to get at accurate numbers in in, in massacres. But there weren't a lot of people killed. And then finally, uh, the, be the most just, and then be a free man. As for the Friday prayer, the imam must additionally be a free man and a local resident. So he should live locally and be a free man. It is discouraged, it is discouraged for the imam to lead the prayer if he has incontinence. So if there's incontinence, it's makru. His prayer is valid because that's a udr and he comes with all the arkan, but it's, it's makru. If he has open sores, also like psoriasis, things that make him flake. You know, his skin so that flakes fall off. Anything that yastaqdiruhu nas If people like, you know, they see it and they, they don't feel good about it because it can preoccupy them. And then a nomad leading sedentary people, it's discouraged uh, by the congregation for valid religious reasons. So they don't like him for valid religious reasons. Suffers from paralysis of the hand or arm or has lost a limb because obviously the seven limbs, that's the idea. They can't... Uh, Leads the prayer without a prayer shawl in a masjid. That's how important the shawl is for Malik. You know, is that if if the imam doesn't have one, it's you know it's a makru for him to be leading the prayer. And then Khalil adds to that, uh, it's makru for the imam to pray nafila in the mihrab because people can think that uh, it's a fard prayer. And then delay rising from the ruku' for a late comer to catch the rakat. Sometimes imams will do that like they hear people coming in and they stay longer in the ruku'ah. It's makru to do that. So, let's see. Okay, I think tomorrow I can finish the prayer and then we can do the fasting. So I think we're, we're okay. So I'll stop there for now. Yeah, we can sit. You want? Did you want to talk? Okay. No, I know. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, this is all talaqi from, because this comes from the Mudawana, oh, okay. which is where Imam Malik uh, obviously took this from the Tabi'in. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not like the Malikis made it all up. I mean, this is talaqi. Oh, so it's mostly just related in the Mudawana and then it's accepted. Exactly, yeah. So it's more like a Hanafi thing to like theorize. No, I mean, obviously things arise and then the ulama will make an ishtihad based on it. Well, let's see, you know. So, yeah, there's definitely some fiqh is a, is a, a lot of fiqh is ishtihad. And when you get into it, you know, they're not, but there are problems that arise, and you have to. They, they look. How do you redress this problem? Like you were saying, you know, if you have doubt, and the prophets get, gave us these qawaid, mm-hmm. and that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the hadith, and they're looking, and then they derive the qawaid, and then the qawaid they apply to the particular. So they have the universal principles, 
and, and with the universal principles, they can derive particular rulings based on, the, you know, yeah. based on that like shak and yaqeen, when, when you have the two, what do you do? And it's not always, there are times when shak overrides yaqeen, you know, it's, they're not straight out, uh, you know, but that's the general rule.